Welcome to the Road to Kyoto podcast from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organised Crime. I'm Ian Tennant. The road to Kyoto has turned out to be somewhat longer than we had planned. COVID-19 pandemic continues to disrupt multilateral diplomacy. Not only has the UN Crime Congress been delayed until March 2021, but also the annual UN Commission on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice has been postponed. That will take place over one day in a stripped-down format in December this year. But not everything has been postponed. Today, we take a look at what happened in October, the first major UN conference on organised crime that has taken place this year. The Conference of Parties to the UN Convention Against Transnational Organised Crime, the UNTOP. And we will consider what implications the conference had for the upcoming Congress, as well as what implications it had for the broader international response to organised crime, and the place of civil society within those discussions. The pandemic has also heightened the vulnerability of migrants to the risks of human trafficking and migrant smuggling. International cooperation through the Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime is more urgent than ever. We need to come together to prevent exploitation and protect the vulnerable. I urge you to make the most of this conference to strengthen multilateral solutions for justice. Thank you. That was the voice of Antonio Guterres, the UN Secretary General, in his video statement opening the conference, urging countries to make progress on tackling organized crime, particularly in light of the pandemic. The conference took place at the UN headquarters in Vienna, in a hybrid format, meaning partly in person and partly online, and it did make progress on a number of fronts. In some ways, the conference filled the vacuum left by the delayed Congress and the CCPCJ, which normally set the normative agenda of UNODC on crime and justice issues. The UNTOC conference has previously traditionally focused on the implementation of the convention and the issues related to its three protocols on human trafficking, migrant smuggling, and firearms trafficking. But this year, the conference passed a record seven resolutions, two of which were tabled by Italy. One launched the long-awaited implementation review mechanism, and the other, known as the Falcone Resolution, celebrated the 20th anniversary of the convention and urged member states to enhance its implementation. None of the resolutions were groundbreaking in terms of the overarching approach to organized crime, but they did take steps forward on some specific issues. For example, the conference agreed to start a new process to consider how to update the international framework looking at trafficking in cultural property. This means the starting gun has been fired on a new round of diplomacy on the merits of a potential new legal instrument on the issue. And this is something that has never been able to achieve consensus before in Vienna. Egypt tabled this resolution, and they've succeeded in achieving the most institutional follow-up by the conference. Through doing this, Egypt has bypassed the traditional way of making progress on these issues through resolutions of the CCPCJ or declarations of the Congress, and has put the process under the Convention's conference itself, which helpfully is chaired for the next two years by the Egyptian ambassador. France was looking to make similar progress on wildlife crime or environmental crime more generally, and they tabled a resolution to that effect. In fact, there's been a long-standing civil society-led campaign to add wildlife crime as the fourth protocol to UNTOP. Let's listen to John Scanlon, the former Secretary General of CITES. He explains what a fourth protocol on environmental crime would look like. Now, the working title we've given to the protocol is the Protocol Against the Illicit Trafficking in Specimens of Wild Fauna and Flora. And if a protocol would be adopted, it would be the fourth protocol to the UN Convention Against Transnational organized crime, the others being on human trafficking, migrant smuggling, and the illicit manufacture and trafficking in firearms. It would also be the first time that crimes that have a significant impact on the environment are specifically embedded into the international criminal law framework. And this would signify a powerful and unequivocal acknowledgement by states of the importance of preventing and combating these serious crimes. The resolution as agreed did not achieve a specific new working group as Egypt did, but it has put the issue on the agenda of the conference and its subsidiary bodies. The negotiations were affected by uh, disagreements over the definition of environmental crime, with Brazil in particular unhappy about the term environmental crime, so the resolution ended up with a rather clunky title of Crimes that affect the environment falling within the scope of the UN Convention Against Transnational Organised Crime. The executive director of the UNODC, Gada Wally, was keen to highlight trafficking in fraudulent medicines as a priority of this conference. 
something that she sees as a particular risk due to the COVID pandemic. Criminals have already taken advantage of the COVID crisis and recovery efforts through cyber attacks on health infrastructure, as well as the manufacture and trafficking of falsified medical products. An international operation coordinated by Interpol recently resulted in the seizure of more than 4 million potentially dangerous pharmaceuticals worth more than $14 million, disrupting the activities of 37 organized criminal groups. More than 34,000 unlicensed or fake products are being sold across some 2,000 websites, including falsified masks, substandard hand sanitizers, products billed as corona spray and coronavirus packages, and unauthorized antivirals. Organized criminal groups are expected to traffic falsified vaccines once a viable vaccine for the virus is developed, posing a direct and lethal threat to public health. That was the executive director speaking at a side event on COVID and crime during the conference. And it was Belgium who took up the challenge to table a resolution on this issue. The resolution did not manage to achieve much in terms of institutional follow-up, but it has given the green light for UNODC to continue research and advocacy on the issue, which will no doubt be proactively promoted by the executive director. Taken together with the official launch of the review mechanism, the conference has therefore been a rather unexpected source of progress on the UN response to some specific types of organised crime. But did the conference do anything to address more fundamental questions? There is no single vision or strategy that unites these efforts, nor one that matches the advances that organised crime has made. It's time for all of us not only to drive forward implementation of the Convention, but to see the Convention as a central core of a new global strategy against organised crime and corruption. That was Mark Shaw, Global Initiative Director, speaking in his opening statement to the conference. And I think it's fair to say that the conference did not make any advances on updating the broader strategic response to organised crime. But maybe this conference was not the place for that. If any meeting is, it's the Crime Congress, which is designed to take a longer, more strategic view and address the big issues as it has done in the past. Whereas the conference tends to focus on the, the context and scope of the convention and its protocols. The Congress actually had a key role in the development of the UNTOC itself. And one of the reasons why the Congress is well placed to make these interventions is its inclusivity, its inclusion of non-governmental voices as a central part of its functioning. The UNTOC conference, while offering opportunity to outside voices through side events, which were held online, did not offer much platform for more substantive or strategic discussion or debate. And the plenary discussions were cut down and strict speaking limits applied, ostensibly due to COVID meaning that there was only two sessions dedicated to the substantive discussions across the whole range of issues covered by the convention. Some NGOs had their request to speak rejected or were cut off by the chair mid-statement, including the nephew of the murdered Italian anti-mafia judge Giovanni Falcone, who was making a statement on behalf of Falcone's foundation. There was no common digital platform for convening in the margins of the conference, So in effect, the conference became two parallel meetings, the states negotiating resolutions on their own, with no NGOs allowed to monitor proceedings. And the NGOs themselves attended the plenary and virtual side events, both of which had very little time for interactive discussion with each other or with member states. And more worryingly, as we have seen across the UN in recent years, there was an attempt to block several NGOs from attending at all. Here's the Turkish ambassador explaining his position as to why Turkey had decided to object to the attendance at the conference of several NGOs. Article 19, the Japan Federation of Bar Associations, the International Institute for Peace, and the International Association of Judges. In such a platform where we promote the rule of law and our struggle against organized crime and terrorism, it is unacceptable for us to invite non-governmental organizations which support criminal and terrorist organizations. We expect the conference to keep in mind that UNTOC mechanism is an instrument between the states. It is not acceptable to consider participation of some organizations which do not contribute to the promotion of UN principles. Such an approach will hamper our real goal of combating organized crime. In the end, Turkey was isolated in its objections and the NGOs were allowed to attend. But we can expect these kind of objections to all kinds of NGOs participating in UN crime-related conferences to continue. In September, at an intersessional meeting of the CCPCJ, we heard that the organisers of the Congress were planning on a similar type of hybrid model for the Congress next year. And at this meeting, 
Some questioned how Japan could ensure fair access for countries due to travel restrictions. And Costa Rica suggested hosting a, a Congress hub in Vienna for those able to attend there. But fundamentally, is the type of hybrid format used by the UNTOC conference appropriate for the Congress? Let's remember that the Congress is actually a consultative body of the UN on crime issues and exists, according to the UN resolution that set it up, to provide a forum for the exchange of views between states, intergovernmental organisations, non-governmental organisations, and individual experts representing various professions and disciplines. So the question we have to ask ourselves now is what value will the Congress have if NGOs are either arbitrarily excluded, as Turkey attempted this week, or if the access civil society has is not to the main fora where the big decisions and the big discussions will be had. If the Congress is to respond to the unprecedented challenges we face, it needs the space for broad and robust discussion and debate, which unfortunately will need to take place to an extent online. The challenge for the Vienna diplomatic community is now to ensure not only that they reflect the grave challenge of tackling organised crime in the political declaration they will adopt, but also in how the Congress itself meets. The world will be looking to the Congress for a way forward on updating our strategies against organised crime. The threat grows stronger by the day as organised criminal groups constantly adapt and evolve, and the Congress is our best opportunity to see if we can start to catch up. Thank you, you've been listening to the Road to Kyoto podcast, which will continue until the Congress itself in March 2021. Thank you for listening.